Hi, I'm Brian Green. This is our uh, GE Healthcare, Healthcare IT Talks podcast. And I have today my guest, Kim Garriott. Kim Garriott is the Chief Innovation Officer at NetApp for Global Healthcare Innovation. Um, welcome, Kim. Hi, yeah, Brian, thank you for having me today. As you mentioned, I'm Kim Garriott and I'm the Chief Innovation Officer for NetApp Healthcare. And super happy to be here talking with you today. Kim is gonna talk to us about a couple different topics and I wanted to start with the cloud. Uh, so one of the things about the cloud is is we've been talking about cloud for so long. Uh, you know, everyone's been it's always been on the cusp, right, of us going to the cloud, uh, but we're not a hundred percent there, right? I think uh, I can count on one hand how many customers I know that are a hundred percent on the cloud, and maybe we don't need to be a hundred percent on the cloud. So I want to get your thoughts on cloud adoption in the enterprise imaging space where you see this going and what are some of the concerns that are holding people back? So the first one I thought of is security and performance. So what do you think? So you're right. I think with uh, enterprise imaging and in healthcare IT overall, we are rather nascent in our journey to the cloud, but because of the past 15 months that we've been living in, we've seen things really move a lot faster towards the cloud and, and enterprise imaging is going that way as well. From a security standpoint, you often hear uh, concerns about maybe the cloud isn't as secure or how am I going to transport my data in a secure way when really we now are learning and I think people are, are developing a level of cloud comfort around security in knowing that we can provide uh, the same level of data protection and even oftentimes better in the cloud. And you know, if you think about it, in our healthcare organizations, we have a small team of people, relatively speaking, that are focused on cyber. Whereas when you look at the cloud yeah. providers, you know, you have a whole like army of people that are ensuring that 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 those environments are secure and that the latest patches are applied um, to those environments. So I think that that's I think we're getting over that is coming to a, you know, a level of cloud comfort around security mm -hmm. that helps us make that move. Yeah, I think the concern that I hear sometimes is about the control of their data. They say, well, if the data is not in my four walls, I lose control of that data. And I think a lot of people are having a hard time getting across that, uh, you know, that boundary of saying, okay, it's, it's normal for other people to have control of my data. Uh, I mean, we already do that in so many other ways, right? And in our personal lives, we're all using online banking, we're using email on the cloud, right? So you would think that we'd be able to get past that. But time and time again, I sit down with customers, and that's the concern. They say, you know, I don't want my data. So, um, the other concern I hear is performance, right? Is performance in the cloud. Um, so they're afraid that, you know, if you have everything in your own four walls that you have control of the infrastructure, but when you're using a cloud provider, you're relying on internet and so forth, you know, your connection to the internet, what if it's severed or something like that. Um, curious on your thoughts about that on performance. Yeah, first I wanna go back to that question or that concern that you raised about control and losing control yeah. of your data if it's in the cloud. And I think that's that's a myth that we need to clarify for folks because I think there's some concern that, well, if I store my uh, data out here with this hyperscaler that they've got access to my data and I lose control of it yeah. when in fact they don't have access to your data. Um, you do yeah. retain control over your data. Now, is it on premise? No, it's not. But if you think about your data and, and to your point, the different applications that we use, healthcare organizations have used Office 365 now for you know going mm -hmm. on five years. We've yeah. used remote hosting capabilities with our EMR provider. So our data is already in the cloud, yeah. even though you feel like maybe it, it isn't. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, that will yeah. overcome that as well, because your data is readily accessible and in your control for you and, to manipulate. And a lot of that kind of you. snuck up on us, right? I agree with you, Kim. It, it, it yeah. feels like it's more secure in the cloud than it is on-prem. I mean, yeah. most of the customers I work with, they're not encrypting the data in, in at rest in their own infrastructure, right? Right. Yeah. Um, but you don't have an option when you're going in the cloud. It has to be encrypted and right. secure and all that other stuff, right? Yeah. So I think as we become more familiar and we're doing more work in the cloud and calling it the cloud instead of calling it remote hosted or calling it whatever, 
Um, yeah. I think that we're, we're there and people will get comfortable and used to that. And so from a performance perspective, I think that's one of the things that we need to be the most thoughtful about right now is really looking at what that connectivity to the cloud is. How can you ensure that low latency bandwidth that you need, especially for these big imaging files, to mm -hmm. be wholly reliant on a cloud environment. And that's, for that reason, we're seeing organizations that are really kind of going all in, early adopters of cloud and, and, yeah. and SaaS-based or software as a service-based imaging solutions in the cloud is that they are really looking at how images are used inside their organization and how long those images need to stay um, right. on-prem so that they can get to them quickly or are they in a geographical location that allows them to A, have affordable low latency bandwidth and B, even have the bandwidth that they need? And we're starting to see that change across the country and across the world. So uh, performance yeah. is, I think, the number one consideration and where you need to be the most thoughtful about when you decide to start using or leveraging the cloud for imaging, whether it's software as a service or it's just yeah. here for archiving. Yeah, and you know, one of the things I think about with performance is it just like security actually probably is better in the cloud. If you architect it right, performance could actually be better in the cloud from my perspective because you could start leveraging dark fiber in these cloud providers, which, mm -hmm. you know, I can't build, I don't have the resources to have dark fiber, you know, between my house and, you know, somebody else's house over in California, but I can leverage Google's dark fiber, Azure's dark fiber, where I enter the cloud, uh, you know, through something in close proximity to me, it's traversing through their dark fiber. These large enterprise health systems could leverage the cloud in the same way. It, it's not as if these health systems that have multiple hospitals, you know, it, it's, it's not as if, if they lose the connection to the internet, they can continue to do business anyway. So they're reliant on these networks either way, right? Right, yeah, and, exactly, and, and exactly. And you could really start to, yeah, leverage the cloud for that performance. Yeah. Um, and also the performance is limitless in the cloud, right? Because, you know, computational performance, I, you know, on-prem, you're limited in the resources that you have. But in the cloud, I look at it like the air conditioning in my house. Um, I don't want my kids to leave all the windows open in the house. But if they do, the electric company is going to give me all the electricity I need to cool my house, even with the windows open, right? I'm going right. to pay a huge bill, but... You know, but I could do it if I wanted to. But um, I kind of look at the cloud the same way. If you want to open the windows and go crazy, you can do it, <laughs> right? Well, and I think that that is a true advantage of the cloud. And and being able to have that elasticity mm -hmm. to be able to expand as you need it. And maybe you need that if you are leveraging your medical imaging for developing AI models, for instance, and, and learning using those yeah. images to teach those models. You're able to dynamically expand or scale mm -hmm. in the cloud as you need to, I think that's a big advantage. And then and then take those compute and storage resources back down to only what you need when those special projects are done. Yeah. Another cool thing that I think about with the cloud is how easy it is to spin up instances where you can you know, have test environments or development environments. Oh, yeah. And if you think back to how we do this in an on-premise environment, often organizations are really limited by mm -hmm. the number of development environments that they could have or the number of test environments because you have to buy all that hardware. And then yeah. it takes, you know, time and vendor involvement to make a copy of the data and, and all of that. Yeah. But now we can spin those environments up when we need them literally within minutes mm -hmm. and then spin them back down as, as soon as we're done with testing. So when you think about all the systems that you're juggling in a healthcare system and, and all the interfaces that come into enterprise imaging and all the different software versions for those systems yeah. that are out there, this is a game changer when it comes to being able to thoroughly test your um, system upgrades and, and all of that as you go along. Yeah, see, and continuing on the performance aspect of this, there's the it's great that we can expand our footprint, you know, that we can use all the computational and storage resources and network resources. Um, but one of the concerns that I hear is how do you figure out how much you're actually going to pay for all this stuff? I think people are kind of worried, just like my analogy with the windows open with the air conditioner. They're worried that they're essentially going to leave the windows open and get a huge bill. Right. And they're not going to budget for that. So I've heard that concern of how do we manage? And, and it's really hard, I think, for a lot of a lot of folks right now to wrap their head around how 
the cloud is monetized, right, from an infrastructure perspective, right? It, you know, how much compute am I going to use? What's that translate into actual dollars? Mm -hmm. um, you know, if I run my enterprise imaging in the cloud, what's that actually cost me in storage and compute and, and, and network and all that other stuff, right? Have you heard any of those concerns? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I think that both goes around having the right resources assigned and allocated inside your cloud instances, mm -hmm. as well as I think there's a lot of concerns about egress fees or that charge that is um, that charge that is incurred when you bring that data back down on site. I think there's a few things going on in the industry that's going to remediate that. Um, and some of those you can do yourselves as a customer, right? Again, that goes back to truly understanding what your clinical workflow is and what the needs are from an image uh, availability perspective. So before you commit a lot of studies to the cloud, understand how often those studies are going to be pulled back or which studies are going to be pulled back. Now, that's if you're going to the cloud on your own as a healthcare provider, right? And maybe you're right. doing this for, you know, central archiving or, or something other than a deep archive when you know you're not going to access those images. The other thing that we're seeing, and, and this is going to become commonplace in the not so distant future, is that our enterprise imaging vendors are developing their software uh, as a service solutions in the cloud, and they're protecting you from that. Those egress fees, that expectation of gaining access back to that data is all rolled into one fee. So instead of just having a per study fee that we do now for software licensing, so we have a consumption-based model mm -hmm. for the software, what we don't have is a consumption-based model for the compute and storage and the overall infrastructure to support those. Moving yeah. to the cloud allows us to have one fee that encompasses the infrastructure as well as the software licensing. So actually your costs become much more predictable yeah. as we move forward and we look into the cloud. And that's a great thing. And then <laughs> for organizations that have OPEX finance models, Mm -hmm. Now they really understand what they are going to pay, and it becomes, again, very yeah. predictable, which is a huge benefit. I, I almost feel like when I talk to customers that they're more interested in predictability than uh, affordability, <laughs> right? Oh, they sure. almost would rather know what they're going to pay than save money, right? Yeah. It, it, they'd rather be able to predict, okay, I know I'm going to be paying $10,000 a month. Uh, with this other model, maybe I'm going to pay five thousand dollars, but I could pay fifteen thousand. Right? They would. Right. They would rather just know. Here's what I'm going to. Well, be paying. and then the other thing that you have to look yeah. at in today's model, we're buying compute and storage for what we think mm -hmm. we're going to consume or that we're going to need for the next three to five years. Oh yeah. yeah. When you're in the cloud, that's all Doesn't dynamic. Matter. The days yeah. of like purchasing that's storage true. to get us through yeah. the next three years is gone. So actually. Your money benefit. is probably better spent because you can leave it in the bank account yeah. and only use what you need to use instead of having it sit out there. Or I've been in situations where we've been scrambling because it's like, oh, guess what? I don't know, for whatever reason, someone didn't notice that we're running out of storage and now mm -hmm. we need to buy more storage in 90 days. And you've got to go back and get a budget because you didn't have that budgeted. And all of these things will be mm -hmm. in the past and yeah. we actually will have much better resource utilization and cost that cost management is going to be fantastic. Yeah. And so one, one of the things too, when you talk about um, egress fees, one of the ways to mitigate egress is a hybrid model, right? Where data that's frequently being accessed is on prem. So it's, you know, you're significantly saving on the egress. And I think, you know, and speaking from GE's perspective, I work at GE, right? So I'll speak from that perspective. Uh, you know, our enterprise imaging products, uh, do some lifecycle management where we're trying to balance what's in the cloud versus what's on prem. There's been a lot of different approaches to this lifecycle management issue, especially with cloud. Is um, I think we can all agree, and it makes a lot of sense to have data that you're going to access frequently on prem, data that you're not going to access frequently in the cloud if you're going to be leveraging the cloud. Um, but then the question becomes: Is who is the appropriate solution? to manage that, right? So, um, you know, it's interesting you and I are talking because I'm sitting on the VNA side of the industry and you're sitting over on the hardware side with NetApp and both are options, right? Where the life cycle management can be tools in something like NetApp or can be tools in your VNA, right? Um, curious on your thoughts on that, on how to handle uh, the uh, uh, life cycle management. 
Yeah, I think it has to be a, a good blend, right? And I think that's where that partnership comes in play between the enterprise imaging vendors and your cloud provider or your storage provider, your data management company to understand who is going to play what role best. And when we talk about lifecycle management, um, I think that there is still a lot of confusion out there about what a storage partner like NetApp can bring to the table versus what you need to rely on your enterprise imaging vendor for. For instance, yeah. um, compression. Mm -hmm. There's oftentimes people think, wow, you know, I've got these images in my VNA or in my packs, my enterprise imaging platform, and when I move them to the cloud, I'm going to be able to put even more compression on them and, and <laughs> save money in storage. When, in yeah. fact, if you think about it, the images have already been compressed. So, mm -hmm. so that's one thing, you know, for everybody to consider. You're, you're likely not going to get a higher degree or very much of a higher degree of compression and, and really reduce that footprint when you go to the cloud. Also, yeah. um, object change management. I think that's another thing people are like, well, how do you do that? You know, how does yeah. um, a cloud, how does that work? How does NetApp help with that? And the answer is that's something that's really managed by, again, the enterprise imaging vendor and not yeah. your storage vendor. So I think there's a lot of education that we can do out there. And again, mm -hmm. that's why that partnership is so important because honestly, every storage provider or cloud provider has different capabilities sure. and the enterprise imaging vendors have different capabilities. So mm -hmm. one question that, you know, people often ask me is, well, how much should I rely on my, you know, on my imaging vendor or on my storage vendor? And I say, you should rely on them a lot. They are the yeah. experts of how you can do this. And, and we really have to now with the volumes of data that we're talking about, we have to mm -hmm. be smart about how we manage our data. And, and I still hear people say, well, storage is cheap, so we'll just keep spinning it there. Well, yeah. what organizations, I'm hearing organizations realize is that resources are not cheap. Human resources are not cheap. So they're looking for very efficient ways, simplified ways to manage that data. And by relying on your partners to understand how you can do that and move it to the places that make the most sense, you reduce your data center overhead and everybody's wanting to reduce data center overhead. And you're freeing up your human capital, your most valuable resources to focus on more high value initiatives. So yeah. not a really clear answer, clean answer there <laughs> no, for no, your it's... question. But I think the bottom line is you need to work with your vendors to really help you understand what yeah. your options are. I think I would summarize that there's a lot of, there's a much more rich set of metadata than an enterprise imaging platform understands uh, about the data itself that your data platform might not understand, right? Your data platform knows when it was stored, when it was accessed, when it was modified, um, maybe what, what type of file it is, but it's not going to know who the patient is. It's not going to know, you know, that they're coming in for another exam next week, right? Those types of things it's, right. it's not going to have any awareness of. You, um, you know, and I've, I've been to this rodeo with, with some of our customers at GE. I've, I've worked with customers that have struggled to do lifecycle management in a storage platform, not realizing that they can do it from the application level uh, because it has a much richer understanding of the data. Right. You brought up an interesting point about, uh, you know, about compression as well. Um, and one thing that a lot of our customers don't realize is that, yes, the data is compressed in a lossless format when it's stored in the enterprise imaging platform. But when you move it to the cloud, one of the options you have with most VNAs is to compress it even further, right? To do lossy compression, to say, okay, mm -hmm. we've reached a point where this data is so much less likely to be accessed and used that we're okay with doing, uh, you know, a lossy compression, 90% uh, or 80% or 75% even, right? right? Depending on what type of data it is. Um, that's another way to look at this, right? Where you can yeah. save that cloud storage by compressing it even further. Absolutely. And I think another thing, you know, and you touched on this earlier, when we were talking about uh, cost containment. Mm -hmm. And I think it is important to understand that there are peaks and valleys in your compute usage um, that yeah. you need to monitor. And partnering mm -hmm. with a company like NetApp that has the ability to look at what your compute usage is and manage those peaks and valleys so that yeah. Oftentimes, you could just have your instance set up that you're really consuming a lot of compute because you're doing a special project, and mm -hmm. then someone forgets and they just leave it out there at that high level. 
There are yeah. technologies that we leverage, like Spot IO, that help us to go out and look and go, oh, hey, that's not being used. Let's wind that down and save money. Yeah. And, and organizations can save literally thousands of dollars a month, depending on how much they have going on in the cloud by leveraging tools like that. Using it. Um, and I want to segue from that into a discussion a little bit about um, AI, right? I want to kind of move into AI just a little bit here because one of the use cases I see for the cloud is machine learning and some, you know, AI algorithm development that to have those resources, to your point, to have those resources on prem is it, it's not feasible, but to do it in the cloud, right? You can have as much computing resources as you want to develop these machine learning algorithms, right? For it to process a massive amount of data. Um, so I think that's I think another advantage to that. So, you know, elasticity, right? That's where we're talking. That's where the word elasticity is, right? That allows us mm -hmm. to burst for these special projects very quickly. Yeah. The other things that we're seeing are that organiz healthcare organizations want to leverage and provide access to their medical images to build these models. Mm -hmm. But they don't want to allow those partners that are developing those models access to the data that they have within their firewall or within their network. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So moving those images to the cloud, first de-identifying them, and that's one thing that we're finding a lot of demand for is yeah. organizations are saying, hey, how can you help me anonymize or de-identify? And there's a little difference between those two terms, and we'll just say anonymize mm -hmm. for this purpose. How can right. you help me remove all the PHI and PII from those images? then promote those images to the cloud and then provide access to our AI partners to develop those machine learning algorithms. Mm -hmm. So that's a really popular thing that is, we're starting to hear more and more interest in. Um, yeah. And the cloud is really the only way that is going to be cost effective and feasible to be able to have that burst of yeah. compute and storage that you need. And plus then your AI partners are working in that instance as well and, and they can mm -hmm. share those models back with you, which is a great thing all around. Yeah, going back to de-identify, anonymization, right? Um, another piece, not only getting that data to the cloud and anonymizing and de-identifying or which, whichever, you know, whatever methods you're using, because sometimes you have to re-identify and things like that. But yeah. um, the other piece, I call it curation. What do I put in the cloud, right? I, you know, you're not going to take all of your CT exams and put them in the cloud for some machine learning algorithm because most of them are going to be irrelevant for the machine learning algorithms, right? You, you're going to curate to say, you know, what is relevant for me to put into the cloud. And then once it's sitting in the cloud, the algorithms need to somehow figure out what they're working with. And this is when we start getting into one of the challenges we have right now is identifying what the data actually is, right? And I think you've been working on some of that, right? Yeah, no, I think you're starting to touch on data cataloging and create, you know, yes. being able to develop the appropriate uh, data cohorts for mm -hmm. the, the data science projects that we're going to have in the cloud or wherever you're at, and you're, you're right. Um, that is a great segue, Brian, into this whole concept of data standardization and why that standardization is so important and why being able to find the image sets that we need very quickly and identify them is so important. So if you, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that we're working on within the um, SIM and HIMS. Uh, communities are really driving towards the adoption, widespread adoption of standards for those uh, procedures, as well as for the data contained within those procedures. I mean, if you think about it, we've had standardized radiology procedure codes through the LOINC and RSNA RADLAX project. Right. Yet very few organizations take advantage of that standardized list of, you know, of terms. Mm -hmm. So we're working to really promote that. We're working to specifically right now, let's, let's have a uniform identification of body parts or anatomy. Mm -hmm. And this is a far reaching problem that goes all the way to the dawn of PACS, right? We've mm -hmm. never really cracked the code on how to have effective image prefetching. Mm -hmm. and getting all the right studies that we need in a way that helps us to uh, efficiently be able to do our work. And yeah. if we're not, per, we're not trying to create new standards, we're just trying to drive consensus to let's pick a standard, an existing right. standard, and widely adopt that so that we have better interoperability between 
our systems so that we have better ways to identify images for these data cohorts mm -hmm. and that the data is clean and uniform. And that goes yeah. a long way to the curation, right? Mm -hmm. Of knowing that this study that I'm looking for actually does contain the data within the study that, that I'm seeking. So it's really important that we do continue to drive standardization. Um, well, Kim, thank you. It's, it, we're at time. So uh, thank you very much for joining me today. And it's been an enjoyable conversation. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome, Brian. Thanks for having me on today. All right.